All right. Good evening to those that are on the phone line and to those that are on YouTube live as well. I'm the Reverend Ellis A. Gabby Jr., Senior Pastor Teacher of the Historic Spirit Creek Baptist Church. We do welcome you to our Bible study on this evening. We are grateful that you have joined us. Making just a couple of announcements. We're going to have prayer and we're going to get right into our lesson on this evening. Um, let's just have prayer first. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, Lord, let it prove now to be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are our strength. And Lord, you are indeed our redeemer. These and all blessings we ask in the mighty and precious and holy name of your son, Jesus the Christ, we do pray. Let every heart say together, Amen. Amen. All right. First of all, we lift up all of the sick and shut in of the historic Spirit Creek Baptist Church, those in our families, those in our communities, anyone that we want to intercede, we remember them and we think about them. We're not going to call the names on this evening, but we know that God knows as he knows all things. So all you have to do is think on it and God knows. We lift up all of our returning teachers and students as they go back to school, all of the administrators, bus drivers, everyone that is involved in the life of our children, we do lift and cover them on this evening as well. Don't forget this coming Sunday is second Sunday. We will have live and in-person worship. We look forward to seeing you there this coming Sunday. Also, this coming Saturday, we're going to have to reschedule our trip to the gun range um, the gun range people ended up scheduling somebody on top of us. So uh, we'll be hearing um, from our Brotherhood Director, Reverend Ronald Williams. We're going to reschedule that so we'll get back to you. But we will not be at the Pine Tucky, uh gun range on this coming Saturday. So please pass the word. It's over email as well that it's been canceled. We're going to reschedule it. So we look forward to doing that in the future. All right, to the deacons on this evening, we will hold our monthly executive uh, business meeting. Uh, it'll be at 7 o'clock p.m. via phone line, immediately following Bible study on this evening to all of our deacons. All right. I think those are all of the announcements I'm going to make on this evening. Let's get right into our lesson. If we have any problems or any issues with the Internet connection, we will upload the Bible study at a later time. All right, join me in the book of Revelation, chapter number one. We're going to pick up right around verse six, verse seven. Uh, Revelation chapter number one, beginning at verse number six, is where we're going to pick up at. We're going to begin teaching right there at verse number six. Let me read it to you in the King James Version. And have made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right. Remember, the writer here is John. John the Revelator. He's an elderly, he's an old man at this particular point. And we're going to read in just a little bit that they essentially will uh, ostracize him to the island of Patmos because of his preaching and his teaching about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So let's get into and get an understanding of verse number six. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Well, beloved, in light of all that Jesus did for us, it is the right thing to give him praise, to give him honor, and to give him glory. Remember, I think I said it even on this past Sunday, that not only does God demand to worship, demand us to worship him, but he also deserves to be worshiped. Why? Because he told us those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And he said the true worshipers. We should honor him with all glory and dominion forever and ever. When we say this, we aren't giving uh, Jesus glory 
and dominion because of no reason, but we're simply recognizing that he has it, all glory and dominion, and we're honoring him for it. It's not like we're giving it to him. Amen. Why? Because he already has all glory. He already has all majesty. He already has all dominion. So it's nothing that we can give to him. Essentially, we're giving to him what he has already given to us. So to recognize the glory of Jesus is to come out and be out for him. Some of you are very like, sometimes, unfortunately, uh, I give you the illustration of a mouse. Sometimes uh, we're the mouse behind the wall. Amen. Many times we are in the Lord's house, but we're not known as one of the family members of the family of God. Sometimes we give a little squeak, amen, like a mouse in a hiding place. And sometimes we come out at night like mouses do, amen, to pick up what? A little piece of cheese or a little crumb without being seen. But we have to ask ourselves, is this worthy of who God is? of who Jesus Christ is. Is it worthy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? This is what the great evangelist Charles Spurgeon talked about and wrote, all right? Let's go a little bit further and explain what it means to recognize the dominion, to recognize the dominion of Jesus is to let him truly rule over us. That's what the word dominion means in the Greek. It means to rule. Again, if we truly say to him be glory and dominion, then we must give him dominion over our lives. Each man or each woman is a little empire of three different kingdoms. We're all made up of body, soul, and spirit. And it should be a united kingdom. The three, just like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three makes one. We got to make Christ king of our lives in all things. We cannot allow any branch of these three kingdoms to set up for itself <laughs> a distinct rule. We got to put them all under the sway of our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. All right, let's go after this word. Amen. Well, this particular word in the ancient Greek language brought over from the Hebrew. Remember, that's the language of the Old Testament. What's the language of the New Testament? I talked to you that last week. Somebody chatted in. I'm going to come back to it. What's the language of the New Testament? Old Testament language is the Hebrew. All right. Let's go a little bit further. Amen simply means yes. It isn't a wish that it may be so, but it is an affirmation. It affirms, it is an affirmation through God. It will be so. That's what amen means. It means that we are in agreement with God. We are in agreement with what God has said. Therefore, let the church say what? Amen, all right? So let's go uh, just a little bit further. When we, uh, it, it, when we look at that word, uh, amen, in terms of it being an affirmation through God, it will be so. It means that Jesus will be praised here in this particular verse. Amen means Jesus will be praised. Amen. All right. Jesus has done all this and more for you and for me. <coughs> You have much to praise him for, so we got to praise him. Would you not wish to be in heaven when your life on earth is over? Of course we want to be in heaven, amen? That's the goal of our lives, to live on earth as it is in heaven. The time will come when all of us must die. Why? Because the book of Hebrews said it's appointed unto man once to die, but then what's going to come? The judgment. Would we not desire to have a good hope of entering into uh, the perfect uh, relationship, into the presence of the perfect one? I'm sure all of us want to do that. But if you are at last to be numbered amongst the redeemed hosts on high, we must here learn 
what type of praise and worship and song we're going to be giving to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to let you know that's all it is in heaven. Essentially, it's worship. Amen. So we better practice down here on earth. We cannot be admitted into the heavenly choirs above without having practiced and rehearsed the music down here first. All right. I'm going to give it away. Did somebody chat it in yet? Nobody didn't chat it in yet. All right. Come on, student. The language of the New Testament is the Greek. All right. Remember that? It's the Greek. What's the language of the Old Testament? I just said it a few minutes ago. It's the what? It's the Hebrew. So the Greek word, amen, is a transliteration of a Hebrew word of similar sound and meaning, and that is truth or faithfulness. Hence the meaning, be it true or so be it. All right? That's the meaning of amen in the Greek. Let's go after verse number seven in Revelation chapter one. I'm going to give it the title, sort of a subtitle, an opening description of the return of Jesus Christ. We all know that Jesus is coming back, right? Oh, yes. He ascended to heaven and he's coming back. This will be his what? Second coming. You've heard of that before. All right. Revelation chapter one, verse seven here gives us some understanding and some insight into his second coming. Let's go after it. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. All right? Let's teach it. Let's start first with that part where it begins with, behold, he is coming. Behold, or he cometh from the King James Version. Behold, he is coming. Beloved, this is not a suggestion, but this is a command to look, which is a bold word, meaning look. It's not like look or take a look. No, behold means look. Take a look. Check him out. Check it out. John, the apostle, he moved from praising Jesus to describing his return. He wants us to behold the coming of Jesus. Jesus said that we should watch and wait for his coming. All right, pastor, can you give me another verse on that? Yes, I can. We would have to take a look at Matthew, write it down, chapter 24 and verse number 42. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 42 gives us an understanding of his second coming. And if we were to turn there, amen, you would find that Matthew chapter 24 verse 42 is written in red, meaning these are the actual words of Jesus Christ. Verse 42 from Matthew 24 says this, watch therefore for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And what that means is be ready to keep from trying to get ready. Amen. In other words, stay ready because we don't know what hour he's going to come. And the old folks will say it like this, don't let him catch you. Come on, help me now. Don't let him catch you, grandma and them will say, with your work, what? Undone. Amen. It is something to keep before the eye of our mind, to behold, to watch, to look. This wasn't a supernatural vision of Jesus' return. That supernatural vision is going to come later. This description is based from John's understanding of Old Testament promises of the Messiah's return in Jesus' own words about his return. In other words, we know that he's going to return because Jesus said himself that he was going to return. For example, John the apostle knew that Jesus was coming 
because Jesus said he was coming. Jesus said, I will come again and I will receive you, what? Unto myself. That's what he said in John chapter 14 and verse number three. Write that down. John chapter 14 and verse number three, which is also written in red letters. Let me read it for you. You familiar with this verse. Jesus said, and if I go, which is better translated, since I go, and if I go, or since I go, and prepare a place for who? For you and for me. I, Jesus said, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. That's going to be the great getting up moment. That's going to be the great resurrection. Amen. When even those that have died, amen, those that sleep, amen, because that's what the believers do. We sleep in Jesus, amen, at that great getting up morning when Jesus returns, amen, we're going to be resurrected to go back to be with him, amen, in heaven. He's going to come and get us, amen. He's coming back, all right? Let me go a little bit further. Christ has not gone to heaven to stay there. He's gone for the church's benefit. And for his church's benefit, he will return again. That's why he said, I go to prepare what? A place for you. In other words, as a Christian, we are prepared people what? For a prepared place. Let me go a little bit further. Look at this verse 7 where he says, he's coming with the clouds. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? He's coming with the clouds. Let me break it down to you like a double barrel shotgun. When Jesus comes, he will be surrounded by clouds. This will be true literally because when Jesus left this earth the first time, he would take it up into a cloud. God said that he would return in the same manner. You say, Pastor, where did the word say that? You'd have to go to Acts chapter 1 and verse number 9 through 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Listen to it. And when he had spoken these things, this is the writer Luke. He was the one that wrote the book of Acts. While they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. In other words, the same way that he went this time, he's going to come back, amen, and he's going to have clouds. Now, let me explain and teach a little bit more about these clouds. It will also be true figuratively in terms of figurative language because multitudes of believers are also referred to as clouds in a figurative manner. You say, where is that, Pastor? That's found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse number 1. Listen to it, Hebrews 12 and verse number one. Wherefore, anytime you see the word wherefore, it means also therefore. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about or we're surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. In other words, the sin that's keeping us from being in a strong relationship with God, sin that'll try to keep us from going to heaven, you got to lay that stuff aside. Why? Because it's a weight. Because what? We're running a race, every man, right? And every single one of us are running a race. Y'all know that old country uh, gospel Baptist song? Every child of God got a race to run. Amen. So 
We're running a race. We're running the race of life. And so when you're running a race, especially if you got to run the 100 meter dash, that's a fast race. Amen. Life is fleeting. It's fast. You don't want to run with weights on. And no, you, you take the weights off and lay them to the side. Amen. So take the weight off, take the sin off and lay it to the side and let us run with patience. The race that is set before us. Notice we didn't put ourselves in the race. God put us in the race and we got to run with patience. Amen. Because the race has been set before us. All right. So that's what it means uh, around these clouds. Now, let's talk a little bit more about clouds. Clouds are commonly associated with God's presence and his glory. Now, I'm not going to be able to read all of these verses, but one of the first places that you see in the Old Testament in regards to clouds is found in Exodus chapter number 13, verses 21 through 22. Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 through 22. Write that down and read it. I'm going to read it to you now. And the Lord went before them by day in what? A pillar of a cloud to do what? Lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of of the cloud, we see that word again, by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from the people, all right? So that's one of the areas as well where you see cloud. Now, here are other references I'm going to give you. I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to just give you the scripture. Exodus chapter 16, and verse number 10. Exodus chapter 16 and verse number 10. Exodus chapter 19. And verse number nine, Exodus chapter 19 and verse number nine, Exodus chapter 24 and verses number 15 through 18, all right? All of those in the Old Testament talk about the cloud, all right? So as we're talking about God's presence and glory relating to the Old Testament, one of the other words that we see is the cloud of glory that is called the Shekinah glory of God. Now, let's teach a little bit more about that. Understanding this connection with the glory of God, it is fitting and it's wonderful that the multitude of believers is called a cloud. God's people are his glory. We belong to him. They are his people are called the cloud, his Shekinah. All right, let's go a little bit further. John didn't need a special vision to know he's coming with clouds. He knew this from the Old Testament. Pastor, where did he read this? How did he know this from the Old Testament? It's mentioned in the book of Daniel. Let's go to Daniel. I'm just, I'm not telling you to go. I'm talking about, I'm gonna read it to you. Let's go to Daniel chapter seven. Verses 13 through 14. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Daniel says, this is one of the books of prophecy. I saw in the night visions, Daniel records in verse 13. And behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That's what Daniel prophesied or he predicted. So it was already written. So John the Revelator was able to go back and read what Daniel wrote. Let's go a little bit further. Also from Jesus' own words. He said in Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 64, Matthew 26 and verse number 64, 
also written in red, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting where? On the right hand of power. The right hand is the hand what? Of authority. It's the place of authority. And notice, coming once again in the clouds of heaven. So we know that when Jesus returns, he's going to come in the clouds. Let's go a little bit further. And every eye, not some eye, but how many? All or every eye will see him. Now, when Jesus comes, this time it won't be a secret at all. Everybody will know. Now, at his first coming, Jesus was somewhat, uh, you know, camouflaged or he, he was somewhat obscure. A lot of people really didn't know about it. You know, it was, it was a secret to some. Uh, we have to remember uh, that the shepherds, you know, remember in the book of Matthew, they proclaimed Jesus coming at his birth. Amen. So during his earthly ministry, he never would have made the front news in Rome. But when Jesus comes again, the scripture says here in Revelation chapter one and verse number seven, every eye will see him. The whole world will know that Jesus has come. John didn't need a special vision to know that every eye will see him. John heard Jesus himself say, therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert. This is all from Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to read the scripture to you. Look what it says. Whereof that they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, in red writing, go not forth, meaning don't go there, don't believe it. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. All right? Amen. So that's how he's going to come. Let's go a little bit further here uh, and talk some more about verse number seven. It says, even they who pierced him, even they who pierced him are also, are, uh, and they also which pierced him in the King James Version. Pastor, what does that mean? When Jesus comes, it will be a particularly meaningful revelation for the Orthodox Jewish people of Jewish race and religion that don't necessarily right now believe that Jesus is the Christ or that he is the son of God. So when it says, even they who pierced him, meaning those who put him on the cross, of course, it was not just the Jews alone who pierced Jesus in his side, but we all, we know John, because we also pierced him, we know John had in mind the revelation of Jesus to his own people, because this is also a reference or an allusion to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 10. Zechariah 12, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 10, it reads this way. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the habitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Let me explain a little bit more. When Jesus reveals himself to his own people, the Jews, it will not be in anger or revenge. By that time, the Jewish nation will have turned to Jesus, trusting in him as their Messiah. All right, Pastor, give us some references on that so that we know that that came from the scripture, that, that statement is true. First, we'd have to look at Matthew chapter 23 and verse number 39. 
Matthew chapter 23 in verse number 39, also written in red. These are the words of Jesus. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, or see me again, till ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. All right? So here's another reference so that we know that that statement is true. It's found in Romans chapter number 11, verses 25 through 26. Romans chapter number 11, verses 25 through 26. This is what it says in Romans, written by the Apostle Paul. For I would not, brethren, he's speaking to believers, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. What mystery? Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits or in your own eyes that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, meaning the Jews are going to come later as the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel, notice all Israel, shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion, or Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Remember, the other word for Jacob's name is what? Israel. Remember, God changed his name. We did some study on that. His name, Jacob, in the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, it meant what? Trick. God changed his name to Israel, a holy and godly name. So it speaks again that the Jews will come to Christ as a whole. Doesn't mean every single individual Jew will come and believe in Jesus Christ as a son of God, but we're talking about the majority and as a whole and as a nation. So when they, Jews, see Jesus and his pierced hands and his pierced ankles and feet, it will be a painful reminder to them of their previous rejection of him. It will fulfill the scene of what we just read in Zechariah chapter 12 in verse number 10, where we just read, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierce. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Firstborn, particularly in the Old Testament time, but in New Testament times as well, the firstborn was still very important. John didn't need a special vision to know even they who pierced him. He could read it again from Zechariah chapter number 12 and verse number 10. Let me go just a little bit further where it says in verse 7, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. They will cry. Their hearts will be saddened. They will mourn. When Jesus comes, it won't be only the Jewish people who mourn because of their previous rejection of Jesus, since there will be people that are saved from all the tribes of the earth. How do we know that there will be people saved from all the tribes of the earth? We haven't gotten to it yet, but we're going to read that. We're going to read it now in Revelation chapter 7 and verse number 9. Revelation chapter 7 and verse number 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindred and people, even into the remote jungles, even into the most rem remote places in the earth, in the world, even into nations that uh, right now reject Jesus Christ and would 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 crucify you at this particular time because of your belief in Jesus. Even those places are going to come to Christ. It says, and tongues, all of the different languages, be at least one person come from every language, from every place on earth. They, all the tongues, they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, the Lamb, capital L, is Jesus Christ, clothed with white robes. Why? prepare for worship, amen, and palms in their hand. Remember, the last time the Jewish people had palms in their hands, 
They first said, Hosanna, Hosanna, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. They said, Hosanna, praise him, amen. Give him praise, give him honor, give him glory. That was on Thursday. But by Friday, they were singing a different song. They said what? Crucify him. Crucify him. Amen. So this is what they're talking about. These Jews are going to come back. They're going to have palms of peace now. Amen. Let's go a little bit further. So everyone will take part in the morning. We will all look at the scars of his hand, the scars of his pierced side, and we will all say we took part in doing this to him. Why? Because Jesus died on Calvary's cross for every single sin, yours and mine, past, present, and future. So we all helped put him on the cross. It wasn't just the Jewish people. Amen? All right, let's go a little bit further. Uh, let's go down to verse number eight. Verse number eight. I'm just going to do an introduction there because I need to uh, end a little bit earlier today because i got to have a meeting with my deacon. i got to rest my voice for at least just a few minutes, all right? Revelation chapter one and verse number eight from the King James Version, it reads this way, written in red. This is what Jesus said about himself. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty, capital A, period. Let's go after it. Here, I'm going to give you a title, subtitle. Jesus introduces himself in verse 8. An introduction from Jesus himself as he introduces himself. Amen? Only a God can introduce a God. Let me go a little further. Look at this part where he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In many translations and in red letter editions, these words are in red. This shows that the translators believe that these were the actual words of Jesus Christ. John was finished with his introduction of Jesus, and now Jesus introduces himself. After all, it is a revelation. That's what the book of Revelation is about. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We find that in Revelation 1.1, where it said, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servant things which must shortly or quickly come to pass. And he sent and he signified it how? By his angel and unto his servant, John. So it is a strange that Jesus introduces himself. Some wonder if it is God the Father, capital F, or God the Son speaking here. Well, most commentators believe, and we suspect, that it is the Son, capital S, Jesus Christ. And we believe this for many different reasons. First of all, since it is Jesus' revelation, ownership, amen, it seems appropriate that he introduce himself. Here's the second thing. The titles, Alpha and Omega, and the beginning and the end are titles that have been claimed by Jesus. You say, where is that, Pastor? You find that in Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 13. Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 13, it reads this way. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, <clears throat> the first and the last. All right, excuse me, the first and the last. I still got a little scratchiness in my throat and upper respiratory area from that old COVID, amen? But we thank God we've gotten this far in teaching on tonight. Let me come to a close. <clears throat> so um, again, 
these uh, that was written in red from Revelation 22 and verse number 13. Here's the third thing, and I'm going to close there. Though the title, it says, who is and who was and who is to come is used of God, capital G, the Father, capital F. You find that in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 4. It is also true of God the Son and seems to be directed to Jesus here also in Revelation 1 and 8 that we just read. But there's two other references, and I'm going to close there. Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 17. Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 17. Saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. So that's one reference. Here's the second one as I close. Revelation chapter 16 and verse number 5. Revelation chapter 16 and verse number 5. <clears throat> and I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. Amen, amen. All right, beloved, we're going to stop right there. God's will, next Wednesday, we'll pick up in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. We will finish teaching that particular verse. I pray that you learned a lot on tonight. pray that you enjoyed this lesson. I certainly enjoyed teaching it. All right, deacons, let's be online on the phone at 7 o'clock p.m. We'll get right into our meeting promptly. Don't forget your giving. We are tithing. We believe in tithes, offering, and sacrificial giving. We're a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. If you want to give right now, you can give via our cash app, dollar sign, Spirit Creek Baptist, dollar sign, Spirit Creek Baptist, or you can bring your tithes and offer to the church on Sunday, or you can mail them to the church as well. Okay, thank you for joining us on this evening. May God bless you. May God keep you. Look forward to seeing you in person, live worship service this coming Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. Invite somebody else out to our Bible study lessons on Wednesday. They can always go back and look at the lessons as well. All of them are saved on YouTube. All right. Thank you to our audio visual ministry tonight, getting all this set up for us. And thank you again for your attention to God's word. May he bless you. May God keep you. May his face continue to shine upon you. God's will will see you this coming Sunday at 11 o'clock. Don't forget our uh, Pine Tucky Gun Range Fellowship that is going to be rescheduled. All right. Take care.